All right, we made it. <laughs> Welcome everybody to uh, this uh, second Tuesday of the uh, Big Data for Engineers lecture. Um, as promised last time, I'm going to finish what I started last week, which was basically the SQL brush up. So there is this language called the SQL uh, that uh, everybody must know. We will see it again in the lecture later. Uh, and um, the idea, the way it fits in the landscape is that uh, you might know that you might have heard of assembly code, for example, right? Assembly code is this very low level way you communicate with the processor. And then a bit later, some more languages were invented like Java, Python, C, C++, and so on. These are for programming. Eventually it all comes down to assembly code, right? But this is a higher level way of programming. This is what we typically call software engineering, right? All these imperative programming languages. When we talk about databases though, it's another category of languages. Uh, we have first the high level query languages. SQL is one of them. So this is why I'm showing it to you. And we'll see that there are others because there's different shapes of data. And finally, just like the assembly code right there, there's also lower level of querying languages. And this is the MapReduce, Spark and so on and so on. But this we keep for later, right? I would really start with a nice and high level query language for people. And finally, there's machine learning and AI. So now we have a lot of uh, low level ways of doing machine learning with TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on and so on. So in Jupyter Notebooks, uh, SparkML is one of them too. And we have slowly uh, higher level ways of doing machine learning, but probably it's going to be within the next uh, decade or so that this will arrive. But this is where we are in that landscape. We are looking at database languages and in particular, uh, Sparkle is just another one for graphs, right? But the one we are looking at, SQL, which was invented back in the 70s, in the early 70s, by uh, Don Chamberlain and uh, Raymond Boyce uh, uh, at, uh, at IBM. Uh, and uh, the first system that implemented the relational model and relational databases, so tables, uh, was called System R. And the initial name was SQL, which means Structured English Query Language, right? And that was the first customer, Pratt & Whitney. That was all in California, in San Jose, uh, what is now known as the Almaden uh, IBM laboratory. All right, but there was then a trademark issue <laughs> with the SQL, so this is why it had to be renamed, right? I think I, uh, I know I don't, I don't have a slide, but it's now SQL because SQL was already taken. But this is the reason why many people still say SQL nowadays. Uh, so another company that started implementing a relational database was the Software Development Laboratories, later renamed to Oracle, right? that uh, nowadays everybody knows. So you see this all happened in the 70s. So what makes uh, SQL special? Well, first, as I said, it's not an imperative language like Java or C++, it's a declarative language. That means that you say what you want, not how you want it. And you will see as soon as we look at the language, it will be very clear that this is how it works. Second, we say that it is set-based. What set-based means that Unlike in Python or Java, where you manipulate one object at a time, so every value is an object. Of course, an object can be compound and have uh, fields and so on and so on and nested structures, but it's one at a time. But in SQL, the magic of the language lets you manipulate huge tables. So it means you can manipulate thousands of rows, millions of rows, billions of rows, as we will see in the data lecture, at the same time. So this is why we say that it is set-based because you can manipulate an entire set of records at the same time. Oh, this is what I was uh, meaning with the trademark issue. So SQL got renamed to SQL. And this is why today some people say SQL and some people say SQL, like usually this is something we get from the earlier generation uh, uh, of database uh, uh, people that got this used to say SQL. So I tend to say SQL, but if you say SQL, then that's fine. Maybe at the end of the semester, you say SQL too, because you just uh, uh, get the habit from me, who knows? All right, and SQL is declarative, meaning that we have the physical execution layer right there that we can and will swap later in the lecture for a parallel execution. That's the beauty of big data. This is what's going to be new there. What doesn't change, however, is the language itself and SQL. All right, so let me now do uh, give you a 101 of SQL, right? So how, how does it work? you will see it's extremely simple to learn. It was designed to be very simple to learn. It's also used by many uh, people who are not computer scientists. It's typically the sort of things you can type in a Jupyter notebook. And actually in the exercises, you will type SQL queries for a Jupyter notebook. 
They are very, very short SQL queries for simple things. Of course, then you can do more complex things, right? Uh, but you will see it's really, really easy to learn. Those who took information systems for engineers, you already know it. Then it's just a brush up for everybody else. Just catch up, you know, you'll have the exercises distributed this week as an opportunity to do that and make sure you know and you are able to, uh, to program in SQL. And uh, you'll see it again during the semester in other places. All right, so first, a selecting query. That's to select records. Imagine I just want to, to have this row right there. Basically, I want everybody whose last name is Crusher. Select from where, you must know by heart, select from where in this order. Select from where is really the core of SQL. Almost anything has a select from where in, in a SQL query. So first you say select star because you want all the attributes from persons, that's the name of the table. And then where the last name, which is right there is crusher. And that will pick the tuples, the rows, the records, whatever you call them, uh, where this is crusher. So it's going to select the second row right there. And you see that is the result. This is the resulting table that comes out of this query where we have filtered the records and only kept the one with last name crusher. All right, so that's the start. That's the 101. And then of course, let me show you a few other ones. How do you project? Remember that projecting is about the attributes, right? So projecting means that instead of the star right there to take them all, you say, okay, I only want the name and the birth date. So I want this one right there, the name, and I want the birth date right there. And that gives me a result with just two columns, which is the projection. So you saw selection is selecting rows, projection is projecting on two columns, and I get the name and the birth date. And of course, you can also combine, right? Projection and selection, that's fine too. Um, you can also rename columns using as, so you select the name as who, and you see now the name has changed, right? What was named there has been renamed to who. And we rename birth dates to when here, and that now, that's now called when, right? Don't worry too much about the data types there, right? This, this is just the type of the column. Uh, don't, don't worry too much about that. Just we'll, we'll cover uh, types uh, in just a few weeks in data models. So the gray, uh, the gray part here, you don't need to worry about it for today, right? Just look at the name of the columns, who, when, name, and so on. The content of the table, the actual data in blue right there, and the name of the table on top. Here, there is no name because that's whatever is output by our query, right? So it doesn't have a name. All right, next, you can also sort. If you have a select from where order by, so here we don't have a where, it's optional, order by birth date, what it's gonna do is reorder the rows here into the right order. Just the sort of things you do in a spreadsheet software like Excel, actually, if you just click uh, on, on, on somewhere in here and then automatically it's sorting the records, right? So you can use order by in SQL to do that. And finally, you can also do groupings. Groupings is, it's slightly more complex, but it's probably the most useful part of the language. And this is what people love to do on vast quantities of data. Look what happens here. We are grouping by century. What does that mean? Look, here we have 23 and 23. We have multiple values that belong to the same group. Here we have 24 and 24. That's also the same value. When we group, what we mean is that whenever we have the same values in there, 23, for example, these two records, the first and the third row, they have the same value here, so they are grouped together. And these two, the second one and the fourth one, they are grouped together as well, right? And for each group, we are going to have one row in the output, 23 and 24. And then here we say we want the count, count of star means the count of everything. And what is it going to be? Well, there are two records with 23 and two records with 24. So we have two and two. That is a group by. You also have mix, mean, max, sum, average. So you have plenty of other aggregation operators that you can use, uh, but this is pretty much the way it works, right? Again, you will be able in the exercises to, to write all the queries you want and try out and, and play with it a little bit, but this is uh, the, uh, the grouping. And finally, you can also filter after the grouping with having group by century and now having the counts greater than two. So here I changed the data a little bit, right? So now I have 23 that appears just once and I have 24 that appears three times, right? But what does the having does do? Uh, it only keeps when the count is greater than two. So the one, the, the packet with 23 is going away because this is filtered out, 
because it doesn't it doesn't pass that bar right with the count greater than two. So what I have left is the tw is the twenty four right, and I see the twenty four. I only have twenty four because I didn't put anything more than here right. In the previous query, I also included the counts that appeared there. Here, I just want the centuries that appear more than two times, strictly more than two times. Okay. So you see, we we pretty much already see eighty percent of SQL here. Please learn by heart, by heart, the order. Select from where, group by, having, order by, in exactly this order. Select from where, group by, having, order by. This is the skeleton of any SQL query. Plenty of the parts are optional, but it must be in that order. All right? Um, other things that you can do when you have several queries, so I have one query here and one query there. So this is a select star from, so it takes everything from the first table there. And this is a select star from, so it takes everything from that table. And now I do the union. What does it do? Well, you see, it's exactly the same columns there, right? So it takes these three records and these three records and puts everything together. And that gives me five. Why? Because there was a duplicate. There, there is one that appears uh, on on both the side. Is the it's the this one here? Enterprise C appears here and here. So this is why we have only five, right? So this is the union. All right. So again, you can put one full SQL query, select from where group by having order by there, union another query, and then you have an even bigger table, All right? What you can also do inside the from. You can actually take two tables and put them together. How? Well, because there will be a reference somewhere. In that case, you will see that there is a captain in every ship, and the captain can be put in relation with the persons there by last name. So, for example, Crusher right there. And um, no, Crusher is not a captain. Everybody who knows Star Trek knows that uh, Beverly Crusher is not a captain. Let's, let's take James Kirk. So, Kirk here, you see last name. And here you see uh, Kirk is here and here, right? So this here, these two records here, will be connected to that record right there. And this is what the join does. When you do this, uh, this join command between persons and spaceships, you plug the person's last name right there to the spaceship's captain name right there. And that is going to give you this very big table right there where you see that Kirk, 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 and uh, uh, Janeway, Janeway, right? So it all connects. What happens to the yellow and red part here? Well, this is when there is no correspondence. Here we have a person that is not the captain of any ship. So it will appear here with everything empty right there. Null means that there is nothing. And here we have a captain that is Picard, doesn't appear in the name of, uh, of in the list of persons. So right here, what happens is that we have the, uh, the ship, but we don't have anything right there. It's all null, right? So this is what a join uh, is going to do, right? And in many cases, the name of that column is the same as the name of that column. That's called a natural join. It's even easier than you just say, okay, natural join, natural full outer join, if you want the dot there, uh, spaceship. So look, persons, that's this table right there, spaceships, it's this table right there, and we do a natural full outer join. We basically put this table together and it's going to connect last name, last name. You see it's exactly the same name right there for the attributes. So it's just going to match everything that matches, Kirk with Kirk, Kirk with Kirk, Janeway with Janeway, this with nothing, and this with nothing. All right, so this is called a join. We will see uh, that joins are actually, um, um, how can I say, um, costly, expensive in big data. So actually, when we do the big data, uh, when we do the big data lecture, we try to avoid the joins. We'll mostly do projection, selection, grouping, sorting, and so on. But joins, you will see, we are going to be very, very, very careful with that. Because imagine what happens uh, if you are joining like a billion records here and a million records there, it can very quickly become quite quite costly and expensive. But there are ways uh, by dropping the normal forms, as I told you, we can get rid of the joins, right? as we'll see later. But I'm seeing including that in the 101 of SQL because it's good that you know uh, how to keep joins as well. Um, and finally, you can also nest queries in queries. So if you have a select from where, uh, here the where is not there, but a full query there, select from blah, blah, blah. You can put it inside a from in another query and you can combine just like a Lego game, right? You can combine queries in queries in queries, right? 
All right. So I hope I didn't scare you too much. Do not be scared. Uh, that, that's basically just the 101, what I've showed you here. So this, 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 to just get you started. And the TA team has come up with plenty of exercises for you and a real data set uh, that you'll be doing uh, this week. Uh, and you, you can write your own SQL queries. I really, really recommend that you do spend the time making sure that you, that you learn SQL and that you uh, can write a few queries like this to manipulate table. This will also be uh, uh, at the exam, right? Do we have a question in the chat, uh, Wenxi? Uh, yes. So SQL is sense insensitive, but what are the best practices for SQL keywords and uh, variable names? So yes, that's a very good remark. You notice that this is uppercase here, right? Actually, it doesn't have to be. You, if you prefer, you can also write it lowercase or in any way you want. But I recommend you do uppercase. I, I recommend that all the keywords in SQL you do uppercase. This is just a convention that everybody is used to. Uh, and also that makes it easier to distinguish if you only use lowercase characters for the names of the tables and attributes, then it makes it easier to read because then you very easily distinguish the keywords of SQL from the attribute and table names, right? So even though, yes, you could use lowercase uh, keywords as well, please do not do that. Try to stick to uppercase keywords. And for tables, uh, I recommend sticking to lowercase, uh, uh, lowercase uh, characters when you create your own tables and schemas. We'll also try to provide you with data that has lowercase uh, tables and schemas. The reason is only that if you start using uppercase characters in table names and, uh, and attributes, then it kind of can lead to uh, complexities like issues. You might need to quote them in order to preserve uppercase, lowercase. So yeah, we just kept it simple for you. So this is why we have everything lowercase in there and we use uppercase for the keywords, right? Did I answer your question? Yes. Right. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, so now that's SQL, right? And you'll have the exercises. Now I have just a few slides that are good to know slides. Every slide is one piece of, let, let's call it a trivia fact or a fun fact or whatever about relational databases. Each slide is one thing. So I just want to give you the, the general idea. If you want to dig in that, then of course there is the information systems engineer lecture. And what's important, I'll just come back to it in the, in the next weeks. The first thing that you might, might want to know is that what happens when you write a SQL query is that the computer will automatically translate that to what is called the query plan. It's basically a strategy in order to execute the query on the computer, like magic, right? This is something you don't see. It's all hidden from you. That's the beauty of SQL. It's, it's that it hides that from you. But what's actually happening is that there's a bit of obscure Greek letters that start uh, being used inside. Uh, sigma is for selection. Gamma is used for grouping pi is uh, projection and so on and so on, right? So this is what's happening, right? So the first good to know thing, this is what you don't see and that's completely hidden from you, but the computer is actually going to come up with, uh, with a query plan. Yeah. All right, the second thing that is good to know is that you know logic. When you do logic, it's true false. So you can say true or false, true and false. So that's the sort of things you start doing in high school, right? And you have and, or, not. Uh, they, they are also used in if then else statements in many languages like uh, Java, C, Python, and so on. What's the good to know here? The good to know is that in SQL, there is not only true and false. There is a third value that's called unknown, right? Because you could not know the data. Maybe you don't know uh, the data. And it just works like this. For example, uh, if you have unknown or true, then unknown or true is going to give you true. This is just because anything or true is true, right? True or anything, that's always true. It's just uh, just uh, one one logic, right? Um, I don't know, uh, let, let me come up with something that is true. For example, uh, um, it's, uh, it's sunny and uh, I think there is even a blue sky outside. So, uh, uh, so, so let's say uh, the, the sun is shining and the sky is blue. And if I say, okay, the sun is shining or and then you don't hear what I'm saying because there's noise, then you, you still know that this is true because you know that the sky is, that, that the, sh the sun is shining, right? So, or doesn't matter what there is after the or, it's always true. So this is why true or unknown is always true. 
So that's the second thing that is good to know, right? There are three values in logic in SQL. Another thing that is good to know is that in querying, we distinguish between two types, two components of SQL. It's what we call the data manipulation language. That's the, what I showed you is actually data manipulation, selection, projection, grouping, but you can also insert data, delete data, and so on. That's called data manipulation language. You're manipulating data, DML. This is as opposed to DDL, which is data definition language. And this is something I'm not showing to you today, but this is the language to create the schemas of your table. This is when you say, okay, please create a table called person. Please uh, have a column that is the first name, a column that is the last name, a column that is the half hour number, a column that is the birth date, and so on and so on. That's DDL. That's the data definition language. So it's uh, important to know DML, DDL, what, what that actually is, right? So here you define the schema, and here you manipulate uh, the, the language. And guess what? In big data, that part is actually much less important because we can do without, uh, as, as we would see, right, uh, in a few weeks. So this is why today I only showed you DML. This is all DML. All of that is DML. Right? We manipulate the data. All right. Good to know, good to know. Another good to know. This is something I'll come back because it's so important. I'll come back to it uh, in a few weeks as well. You can accelerate the execution uh, of your queries with indices. Indices, it's what you find at the end of a book. At the end of the book, you have an alphabetical list of words that point to the pages in which you find them. That's an index, right? Well, we love to do that in databases too. So the good to know here is just, we usually build structures like that in database systems in order to accelerate how the querying in the, is done. But why am I not telling you much about this now and I'm only doing it later is that when we do these large scale map reduce and Spark and so on, we won't actually need any indices because we just scan the entire, uh, the entire data, right? So, so this is why I'm keeping that for later. And another good to know, finally, uh, is that in good old databases, we have a lot of writes. We are write intensive. This is, there is a, a, an abbreviation for that called OLTP, online transaction processing. These are typically the, the old databases of the 70s, right? SQL databases, relational data management system. We like to write the data. So we keep inserting records. When you have a library online, people order a book and add the record that is the new order and so on. And so, on. so we have to write. But on the other end of the spectrum, we also have the read intensive, the read intensive queries. And the read intensive queries, it's also called OLAP because it was popular, popularized in the 90s as OLAP, especially with business analytics and data cubes. Online analytical processing is what OLAP means. This is read intensive. On this end of the spectrum, we don't write any data, or at least we write it once, we drop it somewhere, and then that's it. Then we just read it. And in fact, in the weeks that are coming, uh, in this lecture, we will be there. We will mostly be reading data that is somewhere, but we will not bother that much about writing on updating data. The data will just be dropped on some data lake. Uh, I'll cover that in the next uh, unit. Uh, uh, and then we are read intensive, right? So in information systems for engineers, we were mostly on that side, except for the cubes at the end, right? But in this course, we will be a lot on that side of things with read intensive queries, because you can see when you mostly read data, but don't modify it so much, it makes a lot of things much simpler and cooler uh, in the way that we can parallelize them at large scale. All right. Okay. Any questions until now about these good to know slides? So let me, I, I'm almost done with what I'm throwing at you. This is really just a one-on-one. Something else I would like to throw at you is the name of the, the ACID thing. So ACID is when people access a database all at the same time and modify the data all at the same time, right? Like plenty of people connected to the same database. In that case, in the 70s or and, and, and the later decades, we came up with this ACID paradigm. ACID stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. And I'm going to go through all four quickly. What is atomicity? Atomicity means that when you do multiple queries that change the data, either all of it is going to be applied or none of it. It's called a rollback. Let me give you an example. You go to the ATM, like in the good old times, uh, you put your card in there, 
uh, it's going to give you some banknotes out of it. And it's also withdrawn from your bank account. Well, hopefully you want to be in the situation that either the money is withdrawn from your bank account and you get the banknotes, or the money is not withdrawn from your account and you do not get the banknotes. You don't want something in between. You, do, you don't want to get, well, you probably want to get the banknotes without the money withdrawn from your account, the bank probably not, uh, but the other way is true as well, right? Uh, you, you don't want to for the money to be withdrawn from your accounts and you're not getting the bank. Otherwise, you're going to go and complain. Right? So this is atomicity, this all or, or nothing. This is atomicity of, uh, of what is called the transaction. Another one is consistency. It's the idea that the database is after you have done a transaction. So after you came to the ATM and after, uh, before you came to the ATM and after you came to the ATM, the database must always be consistent. For a bank that could be, for example, you're in the positive, right? You, the, 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 the amount on your account must be uh, greater or equal to zero. That's an example of consistency. It might be temporarily negative during, during a while, while, while there are operations uh, like cash flow operations, but then at the end, it must again be uh, above zero, right? That's an example of consistency. That's the C. Now the I, isolation, basically means that if you are in front of your machine typing on your Jupyter notebook connected to the database, and there are the thousand other people doing the same on their Jupyter notebooks connected to the same data, the same database modifying the data, you shouldn't actually see it. That's called isolation. The, the database system should be able to isolate you from all the rest, and you don't even notice that there are other people. That's also uh, an important part of a desirable feature of, uh, of um, database system. And finally, the fourth one, this is the easiest durability. Well, if you store data in a database, you would like it to be still there in a month, right? So you don't want the data you store in there to just disappear without any reason, right? So especially if you like disconnect the computer or switch off the electricity and so on, that's called durability. Any modification you make to the database must last uh, until you delete it. Of course, if you delete it, then it goes away, right? But this is because you delete it. If you don't, then you don't want it to disappear. That's called durability. All right. Okay. Well, guess what? <laughs> the whole reason why I'm throwing that at you is that this is yet one other thing that we just throw away with big data. Because as we will see with big data, we will no longer care about these things uh, because it's just too complex. Uh, people are working on trying to reintroduce introducing it but we are also throwing it away. So, so you see, this is also the reason why I'm just quickly dropping it at you, precisely because we, we are not really going to bother about it or, or keep it, right? Okay, any questions on ACID, ACID? All right, so let me wrap up that part because we are done for switching to the cloud service. What's gonna happen now? I showed to you the database, the tabular model with relational tables and SQL. What's gonna happen now is that data can have lots of rows, millions, billions, perhaps even trillions of rows. So how do we deal with a table that has trillions of rows? Right? Or data could have tons of columns, right? Maybe, so typically in a SQL system, it's 255 columns at most, maybe 56, but not more than that. What happens if you have a thousand columns, a million columns, a billion columns, right? So probably if you have so many columns, many of the cells will be empty. It's going to be sparse, right? But what happens? How do we make it scale in that way? This is also part of big data, right? So big data can be lots of rows. Big data can be lots of columns. And big data can also be lots of nesting. Why? Because I told you we are breaking the first normal form. That is a breach of the first normal form, right? But we don't care. In that course, we are just breaking all these rules. So we'll also have lots of nesting. It's like in the Inception movie, right? A table in a table in a table in a table in a table, right? So we we'll just nest data uh, in that way, right? And that pretty much gives us the menu for the rest of the course, actually. You see, depending on the week, in some weeks, we we'll look at lots of rows. In some other weeks, we we'll look at lots of columns. Uh, in some other weeks, we we'll look at lots of nesting. But this is pretty much it, right? So. Now I hope you get why this is big data, right? Why, why now we are redoing all of that uh, by scaling up. These are just the lectures coming in the in the in the next few weeks uh, of the semester, right? That's the that's the menu. All right. Uh, so this is actually it for the SQL brush up. 
again, 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 don't be scared at all the SQL that I threw at you because you're going to have exercises on that. So you, you're going to have a lot of time to familiarize yourself with the SQL language. Uh, you can ask questions to the TA if you have any doubt. There's also plenty of SQL tutorials all over the internet. So this is also quite easy to find. Uh, and we are here, of course. Uh, the TA team uh, is here. I'm here. So if you have any doubts, uh, please ask us. And you'll see that SQL is going to come back during this lecture at other places, except that instead of running on your computer, it's going to run on a, can run on a large scale. Field. So, all right. So if there are no questions, Thank you very much uh, for uh, following this unit. In just a few seconds, I'll uh, move over to the next one, but I just need for the recording purpose to stop it nicely and then start it all over again uh, in, the in the next series, right? So see you on the other side.